Hello and welcome to Couple with a Scientist, a podcast by Loughborough University that will interview a different scientist each week about their academic journey to the top. We will discuss how they went from a confused teenager choosing A-level subjects to a leader in their field, with plenty of weird and wonderful stories in between and golden nuggets of advice. As well as keeping your ears and brain entertained, we hope this podcast will dispel the myth that all scientists wear white lab coats and give you an insight into how vast the world of science really is. And because the makers of this show are painfully British, we'll be doing it all over a good cuppa. So stick the kettle on and settle in. So before we get stuck into our fourth episode, a quick bit about your host. I'm Meg, I'm a PR and communications officer at Loughborough University, and I'm also an aspiring scientist. I made the tough decision to return to university last year to pursue my love of biology. And I found podcasts to be really helpful in making that decision, although I found them to be slightly field specific. From health sciences to social sciences, we'll cover it all in this podcast and show you how vast the world of science really is. And hopefully you'll pick up a few tips and tricks along the way and help you on your journey to becoming a scientist. Joining us for today's episode is Dr. Sarah Bugby, a lecturer in physics in the University School of Science. Sarah is a member of Loughborough Centre for Sensing and Imaging Science and a researcher in medical physics. Her research interests span from nuclear medicine to X-ray and gamma detectors to environmental monitoring and intraoperative imaging. During her career, Sarah has also taken a new medical imaging device from bench testing to clinical pilot studies and now to commercial development. But more on all of that later. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you join us today. Um, first of all, the important question, what mug have you gone for and why? <laughs> Hi, yeah. So the mug I have, it is my potion of healing mug, um, which I chose because it's kind of clean. Um, but it's got coffee in it, so it's also appropriate. Um, I've gone for a um, slightly different theme. It's a little gorilla on the oh, side, one of my favourite mugs. And I've actually got Diet Coke in it today, so I'm really, <laughs> really cheating. <laughs> Not sure you can call that a cuppa. <laughs> it's on the edge. It's in a cup. <laughs> um, so we've also requested that you bring an interesting artefact with you, something that kind of relates to your work. What have you gone for? Okay, so this was a bit of a hard one because most of my most interesting things are radioactive um, and I can't really bring them in the office to wave at you. Why not? So, <laughs> I, I thought this because I quite like the story behind it. Um, so this is um, like a little a leather doctor's medical bag um, and it actually belonged to one of my PhD supervisors, Professor Alan Perkins. And in the 80s, he used to drive around with that bag all around the country um, with this instrument, with a gamma probe that he took into surgery and showed surgeons how to use and then it helped with operations in bone cancer in children. Um, and I like it because in the 80s there was Alan driving around with his one prototype um, and now those probes are in all the hospitals in the country. Um, so it shows the kind of progress in medical technology that's happened and hopefully what I'm working on now, you know, give it 30 years, that will be in hospitals around the country. Um, and I also like it because it shows how, you know, science progresses as well as technology. So we're all just building on the work of the people who've come before us um, and progressing in that way too. I like that. Thanks for showing us that. Maybe one day somebody will be carrying around your rucksack. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Telling us a story. Um, so, Let's kick off with all questions. Um, so you're a physicist and you have a specialism, well, research area in medical physics. Um, could you explain a bit what that entails? Um, yes, of course. So physics, obviously, massive topic. Within that, medical physics, also a massive topic. Within medical physics, I work on nuclear medicine and then, um, you know, narrowing even further, I work on imaging for nuclear medicine and particularly imaging in really small or portable cameras. Um, medical physics is all about, well, physics itself is fundamentally about how the world works, right? Medical physics is about how we can use that information and that knowledge to improve patient care and to help doctors give them some more information about what's going on inside patients. So it's developing instrumentation and treatments based on physical principles um, to go into hospitals to help patients. And this probably goes, we've kind of covered it then already, it goes without saying, but why is medical physics so important? Have we not learned all there is to know when it comes to medicine? Because obviously <laughs> we've got such a comprehensive, you know, medical system, NHS, all of that. Is there still gaps? 
there's absolutely still gaps. And well, even if we ignore the gaps for a minute, if you've ever had an x-ray or if someone you know has ever had radiotherapy, behind that big fancy machine is a physicist who's keeping it working. Um, and there are physicists who are designing new machines to do the same things but better and potentially entirely new ways. So imagine, imagine what medicine was like before x-rays existed. Mm. You know, if doctors wanted to see inside you, they had to open you up and, and look. And I mean, that was a revolution. And MRI was a similar revolution. And um, these new technologies that at the minute are in CERN or, you know, physics labs in basements with all the cryogenics, one day, <laughs> one day they could be helping doctors diagnose and treat people. Great. Um, so when you say say you're at a dinner party or a conference and you introduce yourself as a physicist especially with this research area in medical physics is there any kind of misconceptions you get or questions that you always get asked that you kind of roll your eyes at <laughs> um so the biggest misconception of physicists and i'm sure i mean undergraduates probably a level students if they're listening to this have had it as well you tell someone you do physics and there's like the kind of teeth set like you must be clever um <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah, we're good at physics, um, but we're not Einsteins, not all of us. I wouldn't put myself in that category. Um, so one of the biggest misconceptions is that we're not normal people who just happen to have <laughs> physics as a job. Um, my husband said to me one time, and I, yeah, I promise he's very supportive and he didn't mean it to come out this way, um, but he once said, I thought lecturers were really smart until you became one. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but in a way, I'm quite proud of that because we are just normal. And I think that's a really big misconception in physics. That we're super smart and that we stay in our basements and we don't talk to each other. And it's boring. And none of that is true. Well, hopefully this podcast will help kind of <laughs> dispel some of those myths anyway. Um, so let's take it back a bit before we talk about your specific research areas and some of the applications of that. So when you were growing up, is physics a career or what you always had in mind, you know, when you're at primary school level, what did you want to be when you were an adult? Definitely not physics. I don't think that was even like on my radar as the thing you could be. Um, when I was very young, I wanted to be a vet. I briefly wanted to be a butcher, so I don't know what that says about me. Um, <laughs> Bit of a switch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... No. <laughs> I wanted to be a teacher. I knew I liked science because mm. you know, David Attenborough, he's changed everyone's life. Um, but I definitely didn't have an idea on the specifics. I wouldn't have told you I was going to be a scientist. I didn't know what that was beyond like white coats on the telly. Mm. So, so how did you start to really get into science? Was it due to a C level, A level selection? Kind of how did we get to where we are today? So, I mean, I a little bit fell into it, kind of. So I, I liked science. I enjoyed science. I was good at science. So I did it at GCSE and I did it at A-level. Um, but I mean, I almost didn't make it to university. After A-level, I did some office jobs that I hated and I did some customer service jobs, which I quite liked, but, you know, weren't what I wanted to do forever. And um, so I went to university to do a physics degree because it was easy at A-level and that gets you a good job, right? <laughs> Um, and I went to the University of Leicester because it was near my house. So not the most noble reasons for studying at undergraduate level. Um, but as an undergraduate in my kind of my third and fourth year projects, I was working on actual research projects. So part of a wider research area and they were projects that I'd chosen because I liked the fact that there was a bit of biology in there or a bit of medicine in there. Um, and when I was working on the projects, you've got a long period of time working on your own on a problem. And um, I really enjoyed that. And I was good at it. I felt I could contribute to it. Um, and I wasn't put off by all the frustrations you get with it. Um, so I felt like, yeah, no, actually, this is something I could do. And it's something I'd like to do. Um, which is why I then went on to do a PhD, which is the same, but more and bigger. <laughs> um, and that was in that was when I started working with gamma imaging. So again, that wasn't something I directed towards. I knew I liked physics, wanted to do a PhD in physics. I knew the kind of more interdisciplinary, mixy subjects with some biology, some medicine appealed to me. Um, and then my particular PhD project just happened to be working on nuclear medicine. And then 
since then I've stuck with it because it's fabulous and more people should know about it. <laughs> Just going back a little bit, you mentioned that after A level you worked and then you went to uni, which I, I mean, that's, I did the same, but I don't think it's the conventional path, is it? Um, so what, what age did you end up going to do an undergraduate? Oh, now you're making me remember things. Um, <laughs> I think it was three years later than I would have been. Okay. So, 21. <laughs> And did you, did you find it useful going into the kind of world of work and then really making your mind up for what degree you wanted to do? I think so. And I think there's um, some of that work ethic that you get just by having to get up every day and go to a place, mm. um, which if you apply it to a degree, you're already a bit ahead of the game. Um, it helped that I had jobs I hated and I knew I didn't want to go back to one of those jobs I hated. That was a real drive. But I think, I mean, I don't know, I don't know about you. I coasted a little bit during school and A level. I didn't really ever have to try. I think if me personally, if I'd just gone into university, I'd have tried coasting, I would have done badly. And um, so doing having a bit of incentive of knowing what the world of work is like and what I didn't want to return to really helped me focus. Yeah, I think that's good for people to hear because I think there is that expectation that you do your A levels, you go straight to higher education. And I, I was the same, I worked for two years while I really made up my mind for what to do. So it's good to hear that you know other people take that path and end up where they should be. Um, yeah. So that's great. And um, so we've covered quite a long kind of transition. So <laughs> we've got GCSE to PhD. Um, you must have some kind of interesting stories that you've collected on the way, like field work or kind of standout moments or weird requests that you had to do. Have you got any that you can share with us? Um, this is a really hard question because obviously there's like, you know, there's seven years worth of stuff and I've enjoyed it all. And um, I've got to go to awesome places and meet fabulous people. Um, I think some of my favourite stories are related to the, you know, the fact that I do nuclear medicine and nuclear is still really kind of scary for people. Um, the, the word itself obviously is very safe in hospitals, that's why we use it. Um, <laughs> but, so I work with people in hospitals and I hear a lot of their stories and the kind of requests they get and there are people that are going into hospitals genuinely asking whether they're going to become radioactive themselves or whether they're going to turn into the Hulk or okay. get superpowers, which unfortunately it also doesn't do. Um, so I, I think that's one of the funniest areas of my work, mm. just the misconceptions people have when they hear the word nuclear. <laughs> I hope that's one of your projects that you're working on where we can have powers, because I think that's incredibly important. Uh, that's fundamental to physics, that's what we're all working towards. <laughs> oh good, good, glad to hear it. Um, so we've kind of just touched on a few of the highs that you've had, so you know, find this stuff that you're really passionate about, dispelling weird and wonderful myths. Um, have there been any kind of lows or areas that weren't as enjoyable so i did physics at a level and i was only one of three girls taking that course um i just wonder if you've had any similar experiences there well yeah so so doing physics as a woman i don't think i've ever not been in the minority in a room or at a conference or on a project um medical physics is better than some areas of physics but even so um Having said that, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we want to change it. We want every girl who's interested in physics to feel like physics is for girls, because it is. Um, <laughs> but I, I've never had a problem with it. I've, I've never had to deal with overt sexism or anything like that. Um, it's more you just have to be comfortable in rooms full of men when you're not. Um, it is changing, though. As as the women who are coming in now are progressing through their career, the balance is getting more and more. And um, so the Institute of Physics, for example, which is our kind of professional body, they've been pushing this for years. It's not a new thing for them. They're really committed to widening participation and diversity. And it's not just women, it's uh, people from um, ethnic minorities, um, it's LGBT people, it's people who, um, perhaps working class who tend not to go to this kind of subject we need all those voices and it is changing um, i guess we just need the word to get out that it's changing um, so that people coming from those backgrounds know that they're not going to be in a room with fusty who don't want them there 
Sometimes they're in a room with fusty old men, but that's because we all get a bit fusty at university. Um, and there's no malice in it. <laughs> that's really positive to hear. Um, so on, your, on a personal level, have there ever been any other difficulties that you experienced, you know, so starting out as in a PhD or as an early years researcher? Um, I can imagine, it, you know, to pursue physics to the level you have, it, it's got to be tough and you've got to be really motivated. So it's interesting to hear what you have to say on that one. So, I mean, well, I'm sure this is true of all research, it can be a grind, like quite a big chunk of it is kind of boring. You're, you're collecting your data, you do that for weeks and weeks and then you analyse it. Um, it's not, you know, thrilling every minute. So some of it, some of getting through a PhD is, is just getting through it and putting the work into it. Um, but it's the good kind of hard, which comes with the satisfaction after you have finished it or you have solved a problem. Um, I think, I mean, that again is a misconception about research slightly. It's not necessarily the smartest people who do well at research. Obviously, you have to be good at your subject, mm -hmm. but you can be, you can, you can be an Einstein and research isn't for you. And that's absolutely fine. It's a particular mindset where you're okay with the slog. That, that's interesting to hear. Yeah, that is interesting to hear. Um, so let's take it now from you've completed your PhD. Um, what happened after that? How did we end up at Loughborough? Um, so after my PhD, which was on this, this medical gamma camera, which I will tell you about a great length later, um, <laughs> I did a few postdocs which were in a very similar area, also at Leicester, um, which is how the research career kind of works. You do your PhD, then you do postdocs. I mean, that is a downside of it as a career because postdocs are short-term contracts. Quite often you're expected to move in between institutions to get them. Um, you're maybe employed for a year or two years and there's not much stability after you've already been in education for seven years. Um, and that puts a lot of people off. Um, I was lucky to be able to stay at Leicester um, and I had a really supportive manager at Leicester. So I was involved in deciding what direction my research would go in. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're a postdoc, you're working on other people's projects. There's only so much self-determination that you have. Um, so when the, uh, the lecturer position came up at Loughborough, I was really excited about the idea of you know, having my own research group and my own research plans and being able to drive that um, the thing about postdocs is you're there for years at a time. You can't you can't make a ten year plan because you're not going to be in the same institution. Um, whereas now I can properly long term plan. Um, and Le um, Loughborough had also very recently started this centre for sensing and imaging science. The whole idea behind that is sensing and imaging. It's so interdisciplinary, and um, so you need physicists but you need uh, computer scientists. So you need mathematicians and you might want chemists and biologists to be involved to make the things that you're looking at. And um, so it was a centre that brought academics from all these different departments together. And that's one of the bits of my area of research I really like is talking to people from different fields. So I really wanted to be part of a wider group like that. Plenty of collaboration to be done at Loughborough, that's for sure. We're so varied. <laughs> <laughs> So now you're part of the Lufka family, um, great to have you. Uh, what does your kind of typical day look like or typical month? Is your job quite varied? Well, it's incredibly varied. So there isn't really a typical day um, or a typical month, I don't suppose. Um, so as a lecturer, you have like a lot of hats. There's the teaching, obviously, and that can be quite varied. Um, so I do some lecturing, standing up in front of the class and showing them my beautiful slides. But I also help out in, in managing labs. So undergraduate labs, you're wandering around and you're looking at broken things and trying to help students fix them. Um, and you can supervise students as they work on research projects, which is teaching, but you know, it's pushing into research there. Um, then research, I mean, that's also incredibly varied. It's you're reading other people's papers. Um, for me, I'm spending time in the lab running my own experiments. I also do some work on um, simulations or computational physics. So using a computer program to simulate the experiments I can't do in my lab because the right equipment doesn't exist yet. Um, 
so, so that's varied. Um, I spend quite a bit of time writing grant applications to fund the research that I want to do because someone's got to pay for it. <laughs> um, and then kind of the wider, so that's the work you do within the department. And this is, if this is true for all academics, um, there's also what we call citizenship. But basically that's the things that we do to keep science as a whole ticking over. So um, reviewing other people's papers um, or helping organise conferences or travelling to speak with collaborators, um, sitting on external committees and kind of trying to push policy. Um, I've just listed like 500 things that you so hope you get the idea there's a lot of different things going on. I think the um, I think the citizen area that you just mentioned is really interesting. I don't think we've actually discussed that on the podcast. Um, could you tell me a bit about, you said you've got to travel quite a bit, um, can you tell us some of the areas that you've been to? Um, yes, yeah, so well a lot a lot in Europe um, I have collaborators in the Netherlands, so I've been over there semi-regularly because um, we've worked with them for a long time. Um, America, of course, for, for conferences, a lot of the big ones are American. Um, the kind of, I don't want to call it weird, it's not a weird place. Um, the most unusual, maybe surprising place I've ended up on this is um, in Uruguay in South America. Um, so like I said, I work with, with gamma cameras. Gamma cameras exist in hospitals, they're a standard thing, um, but they're the size of a room, whereas my gamma camera is the size of this thing. So, oh, okay. a lot smaller. Um, and the problem they have in Uruguay is they have a, a lot of the infrastructure to do gamma imaging, but they only have two gamma cameras, and they're near the capital city, and then there's this population that lives, you know, multiple days travel into the country who can't travel themselves to come to the gamma cameras. So I was talking with researchers there about how the devices I'm working on can go to the patients instead um, and bring the medicine to the areas which currently don't have nuclear medicine. That's really interesting. See, I don't think people would expect a physicist to be out working over there <laughs> saying all these things so that's wonderful um so just going back a little bit you've mentioned that you do a lot of hands-on work in the lab and i've seen a video where you call yourself an experimentalist which i love the phrase <laughs> um can you explain what that means please and is it is it the norm that physicists do hands-on work i know a lot of it's theoretical um so i think it'd be good to clarify with people that there is still a possibility to do hands-on work so, I mean, I might get in trouble for saying this makes me an experimentalist because all, you know, even theoretical physicists do experiments, they're just theoretical ones. Right. Um, so, yeah, not every physicist has a lab or goes into the lab. Like you said, theoretical physicists, they might be um, developing mathematical models, trying to understand phenomena that you see. Um, you might find, so physicists um, who work with satellite data or astrophysicists, um, they're definitely physicists, they're working with all this data, but they don't collect the data themselves. Um, you know, they're not telling a particular star to explode, they're just looking and mm -hmm. seeing what happens when it does. Then there are those of us who work in the lab, and the further up you get in science, the more blurry all the lines get. So um, I would say as a physicist, I am close to engineering, I'm in that kind of space. So my work in the lab is partly building things. So I look at types of detector and I build new camera systems and I put everything together. And then the more physicist side is testing these things. So running experiments. Um, and some of those can be boring and involve sitting in the lab for weeks and pressing a button multiple times. <laughs> but the setup is slightly more complicated. So definitely depending on the area of physics you're interested in there's the opportunity to get your hands dirty um so let's discuss your specific kind of research areas now uh, we've banded this world around already but nuclear medicine um so to me it sounds like a very cool heavy metal band <laughs> are you able to kind of give a bit more of a definition for it and explain a bit more about the work that you're doing in this area yes of course so first of all yes it's very cool you are correct <laughs> That's the main summary here. Um, so nuclear medicine, um, probably the easiest way to describe it is to start from x-rays. Every, everyone knows about x-rays. 
Um, X-rays, you have something that generates X-rays, you have a person in the middle that they pass through, and then it produces a shadow on a screen or on a camera. And so you can see inside the body. Um, nuclear medicine, and there's a lot of aspects of it, so radiotherapy is also part of nuclear medicine, but I'm more concerned with the diagnostics side. So in nuclear medicine, it's the same kind of idea, but rather than the source being an X-ray um, generated outside the patient, the doctors introduced a, a radioactive substance into the patient, um, which produces gamma radiation, which like X-rays are really high energy photons that can pass through the body, um, and that can be imaged externally. So it's used for a huge range of things. Um, it's used for functional imaging. so. Maybe doctors want to look at your, your kidney function um, or to look at myocardial perfusion, so kind of blood flow in your heart, or they might want to look and see if, if a broken bone is knitting itself together. They might want to see if certain cells are using more glucose than others because that's a, a marker of cancer. Um, it is looking at function. If I use thyroid imaging as an example, mm -hmm. thyroid's uh, gland in your neck, looks like a little bow tie. Um, produces hormones that you, you need and during its natural working it takes up iodine that's what it needs to function so if doctors suspect that there might be a problem with your thyroid they could give you an isotope a radioactive version of iodine that will be taken up by the thyroid just like normal iodine but it's special in that it produces gamma radiation and the gamma radiation comes out of your body so the doctors can take a picture of your thyroid and that will tell them rather than something like an ultrasound, which will tell them, yes, you have a thyroid and it's the right size and it's in the right place. Um, what the, the nuclear medicine scan can tell them is, OK, the thyroid is working too hard or it's not working hard enough or it's not working consistently. Maybe half of your thyroid is working properly and the other half isn't taking up as much iodine. And it tells them the function, it tells them what's actually going on. Um, and there's not many medical modalities that can do that, which is why nuclear medicine, despite the fact that you're introducing radioactivity into a patient, which of course we minimize as much as possible, um, but the benefit you get from it, the things that doctors are able to find out to help diagnose conditions, um, that, that benefit vastly outweighs the very small risk from the introduction of radioactivity. Um, does, does that make sense? Do you have any questions? Definitely makes sense. Yes. Um, question. So when you're introducing the radioactivity, does the human body eventually break that down? Um, I'm just wondering how it goes or does it remain within you under a surf, like a safe level of radioactivity? Yeah, so the body doesn't break it down, but it will, you know, pass it through urine, typically. Um, so that's one way it, it's got rid of. Um, but also, so how radioactive substances work is that they have a half-life. So every time they generate a gamma photon, say, that is one of the nuclei, so one of the atoms within that material decay. So once that's decayed, it's not radioactive anymore. It's not going to produce any more gamma radiation. And the half-life is how long it takes for half of the nuclei in your, your substance to decay. So when choosing a radiopharmaceutical, um, it's really important to get the correct half-life. The most common one we use in nuclear medicine is called technetium 99N. And um, we like that because it has quite a nice energy. It gets out of the body, but it's not too hard to detect. But we also like it because its half-life is only six hours, which means even if it was to be you know, caught up somewhere in the body and stay there, after a day, it's basically decayed all the way to very little. So, I mean, people do end up slightly radioactive for a small period of time. So I've done some work um, up at Sellafield, um, an old nuclear site. Well, it's still working. Um, and obviously, because Sellafield have a lot of um, nuclear material up there, they've got lots of security. So when you go in and out, you're going through these scanners to make sure you've not been contaminated and you're not taking any radioactive material out. Um, and I know that if someone has had one of these nuclear medicine scans, they would absolutely set off those scanners right. to work the next day. <laughs> um, 
but and, unless you work there you don't have to worry about anything <laughs> like you said it's it's the balance isn't it a little bit of radioactivity to understand a lot more about how your body's functioning and get the correct treatments earlier more precise that kind of thing so it's a, it's a way up um so let's talk about your work in this area um, you've kind of given an overview of it. What specific things are you looking at? Yeah, so I'm interested in the, the like machinery, the instrumentation that we use to image this gamma radiation. Um, and if you were to go into a hospital and look at a, a standard clinical gamma camera, um, it takes up a whole room. The actual panel is maybe, maybe this big. It's a big square flat panel. It comes right up to your face if they're imaging in that area. Um, the patient has to lie on the bed. Um, and imaging can take, well, it depends on the procedure, but maybe half an hour or so to get an image of the full patient. Um, what I'm interested in is, is not replacing those machines, but for some situations where you don't want to look at the whole patient, where you know you just want to look at the thyroid, for example, we can make a camera that's far, far smaller. It can come right up to the patient. The patient doesn't have to be lying down. They could be sitting up or they could stay in their hospital bed. They wouldn't have to come to this room in a basement of a hospital um, where all the radiation is. It's far more flexible. So I'm looking at, at building smaller gamma cameras that can be brought closer to the patient and are a bit more flexible. Um, and what I'm really excited to do um, is actually bring them into surgery. So a lot of nuclear medicine diagnostics happens before you have surgery, right? You use it to detect cancer, then you go to surgery and the cancer is removed. Um, there are some procedures which use something that's called radio guidance. So in that case, the thing that the surgeon wants to remove has been tagged with one of these radio pharmaceuticals, so it's slightly radioactive. And at the moment, how that works in surgery is surgeons have something called a non-imaging gamma probe, the same thing that Alan used to take around in his funky leather case. Um, and you can kind of think of that as a metal detector. So it's a, a pole, and as the doctor moves it around, if it's pointing at radiation, it makes a horrible squealy beep sound. So by moving it around and listening for the horrible squealy beeps, the surgeons are able to find the radioactive um, materials. And they're really good at that. Um, but there are some situations where if the anatomy is really complicated or if there's lots of different bits of radiation they're trying to separate, where having their metal detector style probe doesn't really work for them. So what I want to do is bring a camera into the operating theatre so they can just take a picture. They can see what they're looking at. They can see splodges on it. That's the bits that are radioactive. They know that they need to remove those rather than kind of hunting around with their, their probe like they do at the moment. So where are you at with the development of this camera? So we've been working on it for a number of years and not just me, there were people working at it before my, on it before my time. Um, but we're actually at a really exciting point now. So the technology underlying the camera has been licensed by a company um, called Serac Imaging Systems. And they've been working on it for perhaps a year or so now. They're taking it from something that, I mean, I've been building in the lab one by one um, to something that can actually be, you know, commercially manufactured, um, consistent, doesn't need um, a, a lecturer doing things with scalpels to make it. Um, and their device is going to go through all the CE marking process so that it can actually be sold and go into hospitals. So we're really close to that now. And, and that's going to be fabulous. And that's really that's, exciting. It's really exciting, right? It's been on my bench in my lab for so long. <laughs> and we've done, you know, little tests in patients, but it can finally start making a difference. So is it going to, is it been under clinical trials? Is it going to go through them when, once it's been kind of mass produced? So our prototype has been through clinical pilots. Um, right. So the main difference there is we were kind of looking and seeing. It was patients who were having standard imaging anyway, and they very kindly, while they were waiting, um, we gave them a cup of tea and then they let us point our camera at them as well <laughs> after full ethical approval. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for our pilots, we were really just kind of looking at all sorts of different procedures and seeing what the camera was good at. Um, so thyroids, it, it's good at. Um, it's quite good at 
something called lymphocentigraphy, which is looking at the lymphatic system. Um, so you kind of mentioned it already. So thyroid, the lymph lymphatic system. Um, what other areas do you envision this camera helping with? So, I mean, once we get to the point where it can go into surgery, the, the biggest kind of application there is in a particular diagnostic procedure for cancers. So um, if you are diagnosed with a cancer, depending on the type, you might have something called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, so we all know cancer, it can be as a tumour, but it can also spread throughout the body. How it spreads tends to be through the lymphatic system. So the idea with the sentinel lymph node biopsy is you find the, the lymph nodes, the kind of collecting points for the lymphatic system that are closest to the tumour or that the tumour drains to be. Um, doctors want to take those out and send them for tests. If there's cancer in the lymph nodes, then potentially that cancer is spread. If there isn't any cancer in the sentinel lymph nodes, then it's quite likely that that cancer is localised. So the treatment is very different. Um, and that is one of the procedures that at the minute uses these non-imaging probes. So radio guided surgery already happens. Um, but bringing the camera into surgery, we're hoping that this will, well, for start, just make it easier for doctors. So procedures are quicker um, and perhaps slightly more targeted. So there's less chance of damage to surrounding tissues because the doctors know exactly where they're going. Um, but also we could potentially catch some nodes that the probes miss because, you know, they're not imaging. They don't have the same resolution and ability to differentiate different things. Um, and in that case, for some patients, it might make the difference between uh, clinicians knowing that the cancer is spread and not knowing that the cancer is spread, which obviously makes a big impact to those individuals' lives. Massive impact. That could be, you know, life-saving kind of technology so. uh, yeah that's that's amazing um so just moving on to another one of your research areas uh i'm gonna have to read this because i don't even think i can pronounce it <laughs> so on your research profile it mentions <laughs> scintillator and compound semiconductor detector performance i don't know if i pronounced that right um google has told me that it's to do with materials converting energy into light or courses of light have you got a better definition? Can you, uh, can you shed some light, pardon the pun, on what I am talking about? <laughs> I can try. Um, so it, it's scintillators. So scintillators like scintillating. Okay, I did um, pronounce that right. Yeah, but that's a couple of semiconductors, right? And Great. that was more than half of it. So. <laughs> um, yes, so the problem we have when we're trying to image gamma photons, gamma radiation, is that they're such high energy. So you can think of it as equivalent to, if you wanted to image normal optical light, that's like catching a football, right? It's relatively low energy, you can catch it, you can stop it, you can detect it. Once we go up to gamma energies, that's more like you trying to catch a bullet. Obviously not what you want to be doing, you want some kind of vest, preferably a concrete bunker, something that will stop all that energy. Um, and it's exactly the same with gamma cameras. Your standard optical camera in your phone or our webcam, if you, put, if you shined a gamma photon at it, it would just pass straight through, completely ignoring it. Whereas to detect the gamma photons, we need different materials. We need the equivalent of that concrete bunker. And there's a few different ways to do that. Um, so scintillators are one way. It's actually a scintillator we use in the portable gamma camera I've been talking about. The idea with that is it's a block of material that's really good at stopping these high energy photons. And when it does stop one, when it absorbs it, that energy goes into producing a lot of optical photons. So one gamma photon comes in, thousands of optical photons are generated. And once you've got those, you can detect them with a normal camera or a high performance normal camera. So that's one way we can move towards detecting these really high energy photons. Um, the other way is compound semiconductors. So that doesn't have the extra step in between. We're not going from gamma to optical to electrons, which is what your normal phone camera does mm -hmm. to detect light. Um, instead, it's just a special type of material. It's quite dense. It's quite good at stopping gamma photons and it converts them 
directly to electrons that we can read out and create an image. Um, but these materials are newer and they're harder to work with. It's not like silicon, which you have in, well, millions of things around your house. Um, and we're very good at producing those things, manufacturing it on a mass scale. And um, compound semiconductors are newer and they're harder to manufacture, uh, particularly for small pixels. So that's what I'm interested in looking at. That actually made sense because of your very good analogy. So <laughs> thank you for cl clarifying on it. Um, are there any other research areas we've not touched on? So I think I've also seen the word environmental monitoring somewhere on your, your research yeah. profile too. So is there any other things you can tell us about? So, I mean, that's relatively new for me, um, but it's a project I'm currently working on with stellar field, as I previously mentioned. So I have these devices that detect gamma radiation and you can point them at a patient in the nuclear medicine clinic, but to be honest, they don't care what they're being pointed at. You could equally point them at a contaminated glove box on an old nuclear site. And rather than trying to find this spot of radioactivity within a patient, you could find this spot of radioactivity in the environment. Um, and then clean it up. Um, so I'm working with Sellafield on a project to use this camera for the nuclear decommissioning. So decommissioning is all about taking these old nuclear sites and cleaning them up, um, putting them back to normal, essentially. And it's a big job. It's going to be going on for hundreds of years. Um, so we're hoping the camera will help speed that up. And also, you know, again, make the lives of the people who are doing this work a bit easier. Um, the people who are cleaning these glove boxes, sometimes they're in, you know, the full bunny suits mm -hmm. and these films, um, with thick gloves um, to keep them safe. It's very hot in some of these places. Um, it's also, you know, radioactive, so you want to be there for as small a time as possible. So anything we can do to make it a bit easier for them. I mean, gamma radiation is invisible. Um, we're just trying to make it visible so they know where to look and they know what to clean. So you do quite a varied amount of work, so lecturing and all these exciting research areas. Um, we asked you earlier kind of what's your favourite thing about physics, but what's your favourite thing about your actual job? So this month to month, year to year at Loughborough University, what do you really like doing? So, I mean, my job is literally to learn new things which is just the most amazing thing to be paid for. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, so I, I love that my job is to, it's a bit of detective work, right? You're kind of like investigating different areas. You're trying to find out as much as you can. Um, you're trying to find the thing that no one else has found out yet and then work out a way to find it out. Um, I really enjoy the process of it. Um, and then separately from that, I really enjoy what my work lets me do, which is interact with so many different people. And particularly because it's interdisciplinary, I speak to people who are, you know, specialist experts in areas I have no idea about. And I get to ask them all of my stupid questions <laughs> and they're usually very nice and they answer me. Um, and it's a great environment to be in. And universities are so open about knowledge in a way that industry isn't always. Uh, it's, it's just a really exciting area to be able to work in. Like me asking you stupid questions and you've been incredibly nice to me in my pronunciations. <laughs> There's no such thing as stupid <laughs> questions. And if you're any academic, you ask them about their work, they will love you for it. <laughs> All we want to do is tell people. <laughs> um, so are there any not so glamorous parts of your job that you don't like, whether that be admin, grant applications, any of those kinds of things that make you sigh a little bit. Yeah, so I, I think we've talked a bit about some of the drudgery and there is some drudgery in lab work and there's, you know, poking at things that don't work for weeks and then suddenly work and there's no explanation for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that can be frustrating at times. Um, I don't think anyone likes the admin. Grant applications where you have to talk about how fabulous you are, that's just not British. No one really likes that. Um, <laughs> There's quite a lot of meetings. Some of them are uh, great and I get to talk to people and ask all these stupid questions. Some of them are just something you have to do. Um, but in general, overall, I mean, the positives outweigh the negatives massively. Mm -hmm. um, so what's one of the weirdest things you've had to do as part of your job? Okay, so I have a really good one for this. It's a bit risque. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we'll see, <laughs> <if it's good. laughs> um, see if it makes the edit. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. So, okay, that, that's back up. So, I, um, I have some collaborators who work in biology and in understanding infection, and some of their research involves working with small animals or, or mice as part of their experiments. Um, now, obviously, that's something that no one in, enjoys doing if there was any alternative. Believe me, the people who work with these animals day to day would be using it. So I was kind of talking with this collaborator about how we could, you know, improve the situation. What could we do to make um, the animals more comfortable or happier? Um, and one thing we talked about was how hard it is to train people. So, you know, training someone how to inject a mouse is a difficult skill. It's really fiddly. And um, I mean, you're working with mice because you love animals. You don't want to hurt them with your injections going wrong. And um, so this kind of training step is something a lot of people struggle with. So we were talking about maybe creating a kind of silicone model of a mouse. Um, and we did a bit of work on this ourselves. We 3D printed mice skeletons and then we were embedding them in silicone and, and trying to create something that seemed mousey that, that had the same, the same kind of motion as, as an actual mouse. Um, but we were getting to the limits of, of what we could do because that's a bit different from gamma imaging. Not really my field. It was just something that we, <laughs> we thought would be helpful and useful to the people. Um, so we got in contact with a local company who um, do a lot of silicon moulding as part of their job. And we had a meeting at their offices. Um, and it was a really kind of, you know, academic conversation. We were talking about um, curing times of different silicones. We were talking about um, viscosity, which is like how pourable liquids are, and shore hardness, which is like how squidgy solids are, um, and all of these really complicated things. But the company that their main business was sex toys. So the entire time, incredibly academic, deep engineering conversation about molding and three-part molds and 3D printing, um, all around the room. And all the samples we were being shown. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. I never ever saw this conversation coming <laughs> in this podcast, but I'm glad it's here. <laughs> That's a brilliant story. Yeah, yeah. D definitely not my plan when I went into physics. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, that's why I mean you meet such interesting people. Mm, really interesting. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, they were fabulous engineers and they got our problem sorted. So. <laughs> um, so this is a completely different question now. I've been a bit thrown. Um, <laughs> so do you, you know, you kind of had to be quite motivated to, I, I think anybody that gets to doctorate level has to be self-driven very motivated it's a lot of hard work a lot of rewards but it is tough what what is has inspired you or kept you so driven i think i think it's something just some people are driven to know more things and know new things um so i think i'm lucky and, and that's what i i love but if i didn't have this as a job i'd still be spending far too much time researching things that are irrelevant to my life and um, try to learn as much as I can about topics. So that's a massive motivation. Um, but longer term, because of the type of work I do, I want to see the things that I'm, you know, fiddling with on the bench that are just wires everywhere. Um, I want to see that turned into something real that's actually in hospitals. Um, and that's what kind of pushes me to keep pushing through the bits which aren't so exciting, like the grant applications and the meetings about various bits and pieces it's to get to that point where it's making a difference in people's lives i like that the uh, kind of wider picture of how it's gonna have real world impact and yeah i like that um so what's your dream or your goal for your career where you can kind of say yeah this is it i've made it um that's a difficult one. I think when you have a job like this, there's lots of little ones like that, right? So, I mean, the first time there was a paper published with my name on it, and the first time I was asked to contribute to a book, or the first time I was on a, a conference panel, but one of the other people on the panel, I'd read their book. Um, there's lots of little bits and pieces like that. Um, I'm really looking 
forward to the point where you know I've been at it for years and I can look around at other research institutions and think you know I, I helped train that person that was one of my PhD students and look at what they've done because we all want the people to come after us to be better than us right that's what <laughs> that's what teaching is all about and um, so I'm looking forward to seeing where they go a little army of physicists exactly yes <laughs> Um, so we've kind of talked about work. Is there anything that you do in your spare time that you don't think people would expect from a physicist? Um, yeah, probably. So, I mean, we are normal. Even when we're doing physics, we're normal. Um, when we're at home, maybe we're double normal. Um, so, I mean, I read a lot of books, I knit, I play board games and I play, um, you know, management simulation games from the 90s. Oh, okay. Um, I've been making a lot of guitar pedals recently because I might as well put electronics to good use. Um, but I also watch terrible trashy reality for the reality oh, TV. Oh, go on. What example? Oh my God, so many examples. Drag Race, big yes. fan. Mm -hmm. All the housewives. There are so many housewives <laughs> from so many places. I will watch them. I don't know why. They're fascinating. <laughs> um, just generally the... the Kind of trashiest television. Have you watched I've Selling Sunset? I have not watched that. Add that to your list. That's amazing. <laughs> You'll I will add it. <laughs> we're, on, um, we're on the circle at the moment. Yes, I've heard of that. Kind of big brother-esque thing from a year or so ago. Anyway, it's ridiculous and I love it. <laughs> so I would say just stuff that I can turn my brain off and just watch it. Mm -hmm, exactly, like I just it. want flashing lights and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what's next for you and your research? You're obviously getting the camera to where it needs to be. Um, are there any other kind of immediate future goals that you can tell us about? So yeah, so I'm really excited that we've got a chance to trial the camera on the Sellafield site because I mean that's a big deal and it involves all sorts of clearances and it's been a long time coming so that'd be fabulous. Um, and then in terms of what new research I'm doing, I'm looking at different detectors, so the compound semiconductors, for example, that will give us new information. So the gamma camera I've been talking about, you've got one radio isotope, you can see where it is. With some of these newer detectors, you can look at two different isotopes at the same time. So you can maybe be imaging different things or looking at different structures, um, which would be really exciting. Um, we're also doing some cool work in collaboration with the computer science department, um, which is looking at how we can go from these 2D images um, to a more three-dimensional picture without needing the very large machine that spins around your head and takes ages to take an image. Can we do some kind of halfway house where it's still handheld and you're still scanning, but it builds up a three-dimensional view? And I think that'll be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I want to project that onto the patient just because that's super sci-fi. Um, <laughs> And I mean, useful to dogs is too short, but mm, maybe yeah. the sci-fi. <laughs> Lots of exciting things then. <laughs> um, so for kind of students listening to this, I think kind of going into physics, what would you say are kind of the hot topics for the next generation of scientists? What do you kind of think are the areas for them to look out for? And um, so if we're in medical physics, there, there's a lot going on. And um, so some of the new some of the new equipment is, is so much more sensitive and precise than what we're using in hospitals now. So you will be able to see things that at the moment we cannot see. Um, that's always the challenge with medical imaging. How do you, so you've got the things you know you don't know. How do you get to the point where you get those things you don't know you don't know? And this new equipment will be a step further. Um, I think there's also a really interesting debate at the moment about the use of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And um, there's a lot of, it, I mean, it's incredibly powerful what it can do, but there's so many interesting ethical questions about it. Um, you'll have seen, I, I think, was it Google that had a chatbot? And then within a few days, the chatbot was racist. Um, that kind of ethical problem where if you don't know quite what you're putting in, you don't know quite what you're putting out. Imagine that being applied to medical images. Um, if a black box computer program is diagnosing things, 
where's our ground truth? How do we know for sure whether that's right or not? Um, and I mean, there's ways that it can help, definitely. But we need, we need physicists who understand the physics and computer scientists who understand um, the computer science. But they also need to be talking to each other and to um, maybe more humanities graduates who are interested in the ethics of this thing. Um, and I think that'll be a really interesting area to see change and progress over the coming years. Lots of interdisciplinary kind of collaborations and all that to make sure it's in the right place. But yeah, no, interesting. It's so futuristic, isn't it? The idea <laughs> of AI being able to look at your body and tell you what's wrong. Yeah, it's, I mean, it can do amazing things already. Um, yeah. It's, it scares me constantly how far it's come and where it's going to go. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Most. Um, so do you have any words of wisdom for students aspiring to go in into kind of similar areas to you? Or is there anything you wish you could have told your younger self? I, well, always ask questions and never be embarrassed about asking questions. Um, and some of the smartest people I know are the ones who ask all the questions after any lecture or, or any conference talk they go to because they want to know more. Um, and I think going back to this idea that some people think that physics isn't for them um, and you know just ignore that if, if you're interested in physics if then physics is interested in you that's that's the bottom line um, you don't have to be a particular sex or a particular race um, because it's physics and it's fundamental so if it interests you go for it and you can basically email any academic with interested questions about their work and they will tell you about their work because they love to talk about it. So are you saying that you don't have to be a typical Big Bang Theory character to take, <laughs> take on a physics degree? I am definitely saying that because those people are not real <laughs> and they're not representative. <laughs> they're not even representative of physics 20 years ago so I don't, I don't know where that came from. And that's my advice to, to younger people, don't watch Big Bang Theory or if you do watch it in order to ignore it nice and also watch trash tv when you need to turn your brain off oh, yeah, absolutely <laughs> yeah. but i mean i've got i've got limits and the big bang theory is yes out. out of the question <laughs> yeah. um so final question why should people consider a career in physics um they should consider a career in physics because it's it is social and it is creative and it is is fun and it's all of that stuff as well as being the kind of the hard working on a problem until you get to the answer and um, it, it's the best of both worlds and i suppose it can change the world and who doesn't want to say they've changed the world even just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> it can absolutely change the world um yeah <laughs> that, that is definitely true oh, well so thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with us today and have a cuppa um, is there anything you want to plug or mention before we go? A website, Twitter, anything exciting? There is. So we talked a little bit about um, everyone being involved in physics. Um, the Institute of Physics has a campaign currently. It's called the Limit Less campaign. And it's all about, you know, not encouraging um, not traditionally represented groups to do physics, but taking away the barriers that stop them from doing physics. Um, you know, stopping teachers from assuming that the boys are more likely to do physics than girls and stopping parents from saying, ah, oh, don't do physics, do engineering, there's a job in it. Things like that. Um, they have a website, I will give you the website. Sign up to be involved in it. Um, we need all the enthusiastic and excited and interested young people we can get because we can change the world and solve the world's problems, but we need everyone on board to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for listening or watching Couple with a Scientist. We hope you found it interesting and will join us again. Do leave a comment and get in touch. I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts on who you'd like to see on the show. And make sure you don't miss the show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other mainstream podcast platforms. You can also subscribe to the Loughborough University YouTube channel if you prefer to watch the show. We hope you'll be back for more hot tea and even hotter stories to help you on your way to becoming a scientist.